following opinions are solely those of Boatest.com and its test captain. Hi, Captain Steve for Boatest.com. Beneteau has taken everything that they've learned from their popular Swift 34, applied customer feedback, and created an all-new model, the Swift 35. I'm going to take it on a full sea trial and performance evaluation. To both of the aft corners of the cockpit, there's both a 12-inch cleat with chafing gear, and ahead of that, an 8-inch cleat for securing your dinghy. That will also be secured with the use of this davit that can easily be extended, has a max load of 440 pounds. Now, it's important to note that this cannot be added on afterwards. It needs to be ordered at the build process because the lamination schedule calls for reinforcing the transom. To the port side of the swim platform, there's a single 50 amp shore power connection. Now the Swift 35 has an asymmetrical layout. 13 inch side deck to port, 21 inch to starboard. Let's head forward and take a look at the features. Side rails are a comfortable 29 inches high and notice how the deck is all non-skid plus there's a channel to direct water overboard. To the starboard side, 12 inch cleat on top of the cap rail right alongside the door leading us out to the dock and then just ahead at the step, lift up the teak portion and we have the fuel fill and the dockside pump out. Also, notice how this side deck is protected overhead. Fully forward, there's a three inch tow rail, 29 inch rail height continues. There's a horizontally mounted Lumar windlass leading out through a roller. There's 90 feet of 10 millimeter chain and 130 feet of additional rope road. Chain is secured by a lanyard. 35 pound Delta plow anchor is on a roller mounted at a recess at the forward end of the rail. In the center of the cockpit deck, it's a hatch held open by gas struts that make opening it a lot easier. It's gasketed all the way around. Turn and lock latches hold it into position. Step has been added so that we can get in easily and on top of the generator, this is a no step area. Diamond plating down below. There's a generator start battery that's charged by the generator when it's lit. There are additional batteries behind. Those are the batteries for the stern thruster. Right here is an emergency steering tiller that will go into a receiver in this position. Once you lift this out, then you can get access to the steering gear. Now let's take a look at the features in the flying bridge. Taking a look at the flying bridge helm, there's a compass mounted right in line with the steering wheel. The panel just below can be populated either with this standard 9-inch display or an optional 12-inch display. Tachometer over to the side. Steering indicator, very happy to see that. Fuel gauge. Just below, because this is a cruising yacht, we've got the autopilot. Rocker switches are on both sides of the steering wheel and the wheel is mounted to a fixed base. Bow and stern thruster joysticks just alongside to the right. Lenko trim tabs with LED indicators and the single engine control. Just behind, stereo. To the port side of the salon, main electrical panel including the generator start. We access the engine compartment from a hatch in the main salon. With it open, we've got easy access to the QSB 6.7 425 horsepower engine. Service points are easily accessible. Just ahead, the all aluminum 211 gallon fuel tank. Water pickup is easily seen and notice that it's a transparent hose so we can see water flowing through it. Just behind is the ZF transmission with a one to one ratio. Notice under the hatch, three quarter inch soundproofing. We'll get a measurement of how effective that is once we get underway. Now, here's an interesting vantage point of how Beneteau builds its boats. Look at the stringers that we're seeing here that go all the way fore and aft, plus side to side. This is a drop-in stringer system that goes inside the hull and then is bonded to it to add to the structural integrity of the hull. Let's take a look at the lower helm, and there's an awful lot to like in this area, so let's get into it. Compass, again, mounted directly in line with the helm. Four-inch vessel view display, rudder angle indicator, tachometer over to the right hand side. Joysticks for the bow and stern thruster, trim tabs, and the engine control. There's a nine inch display, standard, 12 inches optional. Rocker switches are over to the left hand side. One of them is the horn that I'd like to see stand out in red. It's this one right here. This is a cruising ad, so again, we have the autopilot down below. Multi-function display, steering wheel, vertically mounted, wrapped, speaker for the VHF, fuel level indicator, and ignition. It used to be problematic getting behind the helm, but not anymore. Notice it's hinged up forward and there are nuts that are easily removable right here so that the whole thing can lift right up for easy service. The helm seat is 34 inches wide, includes a single flip up bolster and it's adjustable fore and aft. Just ahead and below, notice that there's a footrest. That's comfortable for when we're sitting in the seat, but if we're standing, 
we've got a flip footrest. So now we can be in an elevated position and we can even use it when we're sitting with the bolster down. Very comfortable position with that. Now what I really like about this helm is this side door. This gives us easy access to the side deck and the cleats as well as the side door making this boat easy to handle single or short-handed. There's excellent visibility out the windows thanks to the narrow mullions that are aluminum reinforced to support the weight above and notice the brow over the windshield that knocks down glare quite nicely. Forward, there's a mounting point for a remote control spotlight. The main battery switches are located at the risers to the stairs going down below. So now let's get underway. As I was pulling out, it immediately became apparent that this boat was easily handled, so I decided to do some messing around a bit to further test the maneuverability, and it just refused to be a challenge at all. Soon, we were lined up and headed out the fairway for open water. The Swift 35 has a length overall of 37 feet, a beam of 13 feet, and a draft of 3 feet 10 inches. With an empty weight of 18,187 pounds, 85% fuel and 4 people on board, we had an estimated test weight of 20,057 pounds. With the 425 horsepower QSB 6.7 turning a 24 inch by 24 pitch 5 bladed prop and spooled up to 3075 RPM, we reached our top speed of 20.6 miles per hour. Best economic cruise came in at 2,600 RPM and 14.8 miles per hour. It was at that speed that the 14.5 gallon per hour fuel burn translated into one mile per gallon in a range of 194 statute miles, all while still holding back a 10% reserve of the boat's 211 gallon total fuel capacity. With flat calm conditions, we had no real way to test her handling characteristics, but we did find her to be responsive to the helm and steady crossing wakes. No matter how heavy-handed I tried to get, she just wasn't having any of it and remained comfortable throughout. Nothing happened quickly so that everyone would be grabbing for support. She came up on plane in an average 7.3 seconds and continued to 20 miles per hour in 15.5, almost her top speed. It was also easy to just take your hands off the wheel and let her run as there was no wandering of the heading whatsoever. She's clearly made for long runs and it seems the autopilot is more of a convenience than a necessity. Coming back to the dock, I had another chance to check her docking capabilities out, and it was without surprise. And then the convenience of the side doors showed up as I stepped out and tied her up single-handed, a trademark of how well Swifts can be operated with no crew. Well, we've got ease of handling, great maneuverability, and comfort, but that's another video. Be sure to look for it. For now, that's my full sea trial and performance evaluation of the all-new Swift 35. For BoatTest.com, I'm Captain Steve. We'll see you on the water.